This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. This is the second conversation with Ishan from Emperor that I have to share with you. The conversation was recorded prior to Emperor's shows in Sydney and Melbourne in April 2019. And the chat has been available via the Scars and Guitars podcast apps since this is the first time that I'm offering the conversation via YouTube. Throughout the conversation, Ishan talks about the album Anthems to the Welkin at Dusk, his thoughts on that album being number one on the independent charts in Australia, had a big impact down under, no doubt about that. His thoughts on the later career Nine Equilibrium and Prometheus albums. We also veer into his solo material, where he talks about the difference between the Ishan fan and the Emperor fan. Something different, he talks about, well, I ask him a question about becoming a guitar playing icon. You'll have to hear his response to that one there. And uh, why the guitar, why he feels the guitar is simply a medium for him to create and we also discuss why he thinks acts such as Ghost and Ramstein create an experience. So this is part two. The second conversation that I'm offering with Ishan. Both conversations are career highlights as far as my podcasting career is and journey is concerned. Well, wow. it's always an honor to talk to him. So here he is for your listening pleasure, Ishan from Emperor. This tour, you, you've got to know by now, mate, that... Uh, we have been looking forward to it for a heck of a long time. We had a chat about a year ago. No, it wasn't even a year ago, about eight months ago or so at the release mm, of um, Armour. And I think that did really well for you, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, I mean, it's the, the yourself coming down here in solo geese and then coming down with Emperor within the space of 12 months, mate, you must love us. And you really are rewarding that love. So thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely! No, I mean, uh, it, it, it's uh, truly our our privilege. I mean, and it, for, for Emperor to go to Australia has been in the talks for for a long while, you know, mm-hmm. because we we were never there, and and since we we're doing very very few select shows, you know, in the, these periods where where we do live shows, you know, it's um, it's important for us to try and cover new ground and try to reach out where where we haven't been, you know, and there mm-hmm. there, there are so many. Uh, you know, practical aspects of you know pulling that machinery around. Uh, so, so most definitely, you know, me having the experience of of touring there in May mm. uh, and being able to report back that everything, you know, from organization, traveling, every, you know, the people, mm-hmm. the fans, everything was like top notch. You know, and uh, had such. Of course, you know it's. Uh, it makes sense to 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 come back absolutely, and I've I've been looking forward to 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 coming back uh, since since you know May absolutely yeah, wonderful. It's wonderful. a long travel, but but to to know that everything will be you know on route and and everything was so so professional and relaxing, and the people are you know so so down to earth and uh, and uh, and for real. You know, it's uh, yep. it's uh, yeah, it felt good. So I think it was it, w- it was not hard to convince the others. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it wasn't. Yeah, I actually worked with Dicey. My claim to fame when I worked with Dicey from Soundworks was that I had to go and get the cheese platter. I just thought I'd go along and see what it was all about. But when he when I was uh, I did a bit of crewing for Mayhem when they came down, and I'm the one who got their cheese platter and their deli meats and all the rest of it for them. Their orange juice. Um, so I, well, okay. <laughs> I had a little bit of a taste of what it's like backstage there because I'm from Brisbane. So the uh, I think they played at the Triffid, if I'm not mistaken. So um, you had a bit of a taste of what it must be like to sort of, you know, help out you guys when you do come down. It is, it is a bloody long way and it's a hell of a long way to come for someone to stuff it up. And I think observing Dicey and the way that the Soundworks guys go about things, mate, you know, I think you're you bang on. I think your experience has been replicated across a lot of bands that have made the uh, – what? How many thousands of kilometers between here and Norway? I don't know. Ten thousand, maybe longer. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I just know it's it's like a tw- twenty-four hour you know flight altogether. It's horrendous. So um, yeah, yeah, but that's that's a challenge. I mean, I, I just did a European tour 
this uh, this late autumn with the neo blue scaris you know and they as oh, yeah. i mean they're in a different situation i mean there's uh there's such a long you know for, for them at you know for a band at at their level mm. you know or for any any band in, in australia to to kind of compete with similar bands in europe you know where the scene obviously there there's a bigger market than everything scene, yeah. yeah yeah so it's a, they were saying you know they 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 have a start cost you know just just that yep. to just get to europe that is uh, that is insane so mm, yeah. it's uh, yeah, yeah. Look, and the other thing too, I don't know whether this is um, just something that's been put on the um, on the promo flyer be- because it sounds interesting, or whether it's actually the case. But you're performing. I'm just reading from it here. You're performing the entire anthems to the Welkin at dusk. So you're performing the album in full, and this is the only territory that you're doing it in. Is that correct? No, no. We we've um, that's kind of been the concept for okay. the, the few re- re- recent shows that we've done. Mm. So, so uh, what can I say? I mean, the, the anthems, so many of the anthem songs have kind of been a regular part. And for a long, for a long while, mm. but uh, so in the end, it made sense to kind of with the 20th anniversary and everything that we had for it, it, it made sense to, to play that album in its entirety. Yep. In some way, it, it, it has this kind of very natural ebb and flow you know, of, of energy, you know, as an album. Mm. Uh, I like to say, uh, say that this, this is kind of, for, for me personally, I feel like it's the first proper full length from Emperor. Wow, Not okay. to know this, yep. this reg- but in the Nights of the Eclipse was still a, comp- a compile of previously recorded songs and some you. new songs, mm-hmm. whereas whereas anthems, you know, was written, you know, f- for the purpose of being that album. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, uh, everything that we, uh, so many things that we we reached for on the EP and 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 in the lights of the clips were you know, stepping stones to to getting to that. So I think for 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 that more old school. Uh, expression, but with the keyboards and what we had in mind for it, I think we, we anthems was more like a conclusion of where we were heading. Yes, you know, and then I understand. yeah, so yeah. so 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 for, for for that end of of um, of the expression, and uh, it's just become one of those albums where uh, people seem to have a similar relationship to it. From, you know, for the time it came out yeah. and where they were at, in a similar way that we have a relationship to, you know, to, to my relationship to, to our Maiden Seven Son album, for example. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> there, there are so many things. Of, Great yeah, comparison. No, no, but not, not, not comparing them at all, like, you know, to the quality of it, but it's just my personal relationship and how many aspects of my life and memories and everything that I have to that album, mm. you know, from, from the Our Maiden album. And then to, to, of course, obviously, anthems ha- had an effect on on our lives as well. You know, to to uh, to as as a part of where we're at today. Mm. Uh, but but also to see when we've been playing playing these songs and playing the uh, the album, to see people have um, a similar kind of attachment to to music that we happen to be part of. You know, it's um, uh, is a, is a very nice thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I like, you know why I like the comparison between um, Anthems and also Seventh Son? That was, I got into, I remember buying Anthems at the record store in 1997. I remember buying it not long after it came out because I was already a devotee at the time. And I remember mm-hmm. buying, I think at the same time, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son from a second rec- secondhand record place. Because Iron Maiden, don't get me wrong, but Iron Maiden couldn't give away their albums during the mid 90s. It just wasn't the favourable era for metal, as you probably remember, except for you guys. You guys were the leading light. Um, but I remember... Apart from it, actually, someone just sent me a picture that it took me found an old fax <laughs> from... from uh, um, was that um, Metal Invasion? No. Metal Invasion. From Australia. Oh, no, uh, so modern, it was, modern, modern Invasion. Mo- mo- modern, modern Invasion, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it was this, uh, it, it was this printout from some newspaper or something that we were number one in the in the hard rock charts. Yeah, that'd uh, be right in Australia. 
yeah. ab- above uh, Pantera. You know. <laughs> yes. Well, it was a, it's so, a deserved. That's crazy. It's a deserved position. <laughs> I, I, Emperor were one of those bands back in the day that every metal fan, everybody that stuck around and was still into metal was into Emperor. You couldn't talk to someone who had a bad word to say about your music. So I guess my question for you is you, you must be aware at this point how endearing, how how uh, much beloved Emperor is by metal fans across the globe, particularly here in Australia. Well, uh, again, it's, it's, it's hard to... Uh, I guess I have a very... I like, or at least I like to think I have a very healthy, you know, relationship to all that, and mm. and I think uh, uh, because I, at, at the time it came out, as I say, it was uh, uh, very welcomed uh, among you know extreme metal fans. Yeah. I think yeah, at least to, so, fans, to some yeah. extent. Yeah, but 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 it was still such a, an underground phenomenon. So by the May, I remember, you know, like Metal Hammer UK and Kerrang, or they absolutely slaughtered the album. They thought it was, you know, a right? pretentious piece of crap. Yeah, yeah, it's so much of the major media. And, you know, later on, you know, I've seen in the and Eclipse and Anthems, you know, back to back with the first Black Sabbath album, like most important, blah, blah, blah. Yes. So, so <laughs> I've, I, I've them, kind of yeah. seen... From from both sides of the spectrum, how people or or what you know, not people, but you know, the, the music scene kind of have changed their attitude. The albums are the same, but people mm. the, the value that people it is like the stock market in a way. So yeah. so that, that I think have helped us to keep a very personal and very telemark norway attitude to the whole thing that sometimes things is blown out of proportion sometimes you know it's uh, it's uh, under underestimated you know the, you have no control of that you only have the control to do your best every time mm-hmm. it's, it's like when i when i go play the same festivals with each on an emperor sometimes i'm on the middle of the poster sometimes on the top of the poster yeah. i'm the same person you know yeah. so i had some discussions about that when i i don't need I can carry my own guitar when I play solo. I don't need anyone to carry my guitar when I play with Emperor. Hmm. It's not like I, I I grow, you know, extra skills to play songs <laughs> I, I I wrote when I was sixteen. Yeah. You know, so so you, you, I think uh, we have we have that uh, very Norwegian attitude to the whole thing, but at the same time, extremely humbling you know as a matter of chance and luck and hopefully because not because of necessarily talent but because we were very genuine in what we we wanted to express Mm. you know people believe more importantly you know people believed it and i think that is the the, the rule of thumb here that you don't have to try to be smart or or do the right thing because that will only help you kind of to to wear off the edges of what makes you unique, I think, as an artist. So, so the fact that we were uncompromising always, that communicated to, you know, metal fans, who, you know, who were drawn to this music because they want something for real. Hmm. You know, yes. they don't want the McDonald's of music. They want something that is raw and, uh, and, uh, and real. Hmm. And not created to sell or, or anything like that. So, so, um, to, to see that, you know, are very selfish and uh, and uh, uh, overblown teenage egos, and but all that we put into it, uh, so uncompromisingly, have become, yeah, what it is. And to, to see people have that relationship to it, and mm-hmm. more more from an outside perspective, too, it's it's kind of humbling to 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 be to be able to be part of that and, and join that occasionally yeah, and yeah. To, to have that common uh, experience when playing these songs live and, and, and kind of getting the feedback from an audience as well. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I'll just, I'll just do a time check because I, I might be the last one. I'm not sure, but are you cool if I ask you one more question or are we free to just have a bit more of a conversation? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. Now I reckon uh, my favorite album from Emperor would be Nine Equilibrium. I think it's One X or Nine Equilibrium. What's your relationship mm-hmm. like with that album these days? Is, do you get a lot of feedback from fans that they too enjoy it? Oh, oh yes, and spe- especially now since we did <laughs> we did uh, play the entire Inlays the Eclipse in yep. 2014. 
and and uh, the entire anthems we started playing that in 2017 uh, and mm-hmm. people are now asking will you do the entire equilibrium you know in 2019 mm-hmm. but uh, but no uh, that that's not going to happen but obviously there there are uh, i th- i think there are definitely songs on there that uh, are great to play play live and uh, it, it, to me that it's a it's another step in a new direction as i said i think we came to a con- somewhat a, some kind of musical conclusion with mm-hmm. with anthems and that building on that doing something else and i uh, it's quite obvious that uh, prometheus is is a different thing again yes and, yeah definitely uh, yeah yeah. And uh, and uh, I think through my my solo stuff as well. I think I'm not sure, sure how well you know my my catalog there, but I think there's also a, some kind of development and the come to a conclusion, then something new. So it's it's basically uh, personally as as musician, I, I kind of follow the same ideal. So so each album is just a representation of of uh, another attempt of. Uh, expressing many of the same basic things hmm. to keep the uh, excitement going, you know, hmm. to, to keep myself excited about what I do. Yeah, I, I could definitely hear echoes of Prometheus in The Adversary, so the album that you released in 2006. And I'm just reading Wikipedia now, and I didn't know this, so assuming Wikipedia is correct, so this is a question for you. Did you compose Prometheus entirely by yourself? Because that's what it says here on, on Wikipedia. But was there not a lot of input from the other guys on that one? No, no, I did it on my own. Aha, uh-huh, there you go. Right, I didn't know that all these years. I didn't know it, that. Yeah. It, 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 it was totally open-ended, you know, but at that point, I think they were so you know focused on Cyclone and everything, and it was very much decided that this would be the, the last album. Hmm. So, so uh, in that respect, I, I don't think Samos and, and and Prim are particularly invested in Prometheus. So it okay. uh, it very much ref- reflects where we were at as a band. Oh, yeah, I think it. Yeah. I think you know the, it was a gradual progression. I mean. Uh, Creatively, me and Samos was more 50 50, you know, as for input on, on music and everything with, with uh, Eclipse. But uh, I think the, my, you know, the creative input, as I was, you know, by anthems, I was doing all the lyrics, you know, and, and I've always been doing all the, all the keyboard arrangements and all that. And so just gradually, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I probably did 75% of. Of the music of, of equilibrium as well and eventually i ended up just writing everything for, for, for promises by go. myself okay so yeah. so so um, it was just you know the dynamics of things and but uh, um but some of us obviously have had uh, we we've already had a very 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 50 50 split you know of our uh ownership if you will of, of emperor because yeah. it's uh, it, he even you know even though i've, I've had it, uh, an extensive Part of the, the creative side, you know, he's, you know, the driving force. He, he's been very much functioning as, you know, uh, as management and yep. and uh, and you know, so so we've, we've both put just as much in it, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. The other thing too about Emperor is a bit like Seinfeld and Faith No More the first time around. You knew when to stop, and I really think fans appreciate that more than what artists actually want to acknowledge. So. You stopped doing it effectively when some of the parties in the band didn't want to. They had they had their focus elsewhere. They had the focus elsewhere, and rather than losing the nucleus of the band, you decided to stop doing it. And I think fans were rewarded with your wonderful solo material, which I think probably your best album, mainly because of the sound, was Armor. That's an album I've listened to a lot. And last time we chat, we we talked a well, lot about you. how you achieved the sound on that. You know, and I, I still haven't heard an album that has that that very tight. You did you mentioned that you did something with the drums that I didn't I didn't notate it out. Sorry, so I'm going by memory here. But uh, you mentioned that you did something with the drums that I still haven't heard any any bands do. And it's yeah, been, yeah, yeah. What was that? No, we we yeah we do, we just dampened we we tuned them really low and yeah. just dampened everything and even 
except for for some of the more ballady songs you know mm-hmm. we even we, we stacked cymbals you know where we tightened it very much they're just short percussive sounds rather than you know sustaining cymbals mm-hmm. so it all you know combines into it becomes a very very close and and attacky <laughs> it does. It's it's and it, the thing that I really appreciated about it is because I've got a car that doesn't quite have an integrated um, sound system. I can't, you know, no Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever. So, you know, it doesn't do a handover from my iPhone to the car's sound system. So I've got to listen to things through my iPhone. That album sounds superb on those shitty iPhone speakers. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, it really is, and it's and I'm at a point now where I really can't listen to things that don't sound A grade quality. Over the, over the phone. It's not the artist's fault. I know that. I know bands are constrained by budgets and the like. But to me these days, it really feels as though the quality of the sound is as important as the music that you're creating. Would that, would that ring yeah, true? I guess. Well, pr- production has become such such an integral part of, uh, as, as I said, you know, it, in the past, um, like anthems, you know, it was very much a construction of, you know, made in the rehearsal space, the pre-production was done in the rehearsal space, and uh, um, these days we kind of make albums, you know, on computers, and then have to learn how to play them after the fact to play mm-hmm. them live. Mm-hmm. So, so, so that so production has become, and I guess for for me, just how I work, you know, production has uh, has played a, a bigger and bigger part of of how I I I, I write. Mm. So, but uh, but of course, this the sound uh, is of course very much um, very much to credit to to Linus Cornelius who who mixed the album sure. and yeah. uh, and and Jens Borgen who mastered it too. Oh, Jens, yeah, God, he's on everything. Also, fo- yeah, follow he's along. Great. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. He just, yeah, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, but it, but it, 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 that's why I've kind of you know just kept on to my my. A working relation with with Fascination Street because I know by now you know how I record stuff and how I produce things in the studio and you know the, the communication I have with them you know I know they will emphasize and 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 make my my uh, sonic ideas work <laughs> mm. and that helps <laughs> it always bloody helps it doesn't helps. it yeah yeah hey what about when you're looking out over a crowd say with your solo material versus Emperor, is there a difference or do you by and large see a similar type of fan? I know it's a, it's a silly question in some way, but do you, do you think there's a difference in the, the, the Emperor fan and the Ishan fan? Yeah, I, th- I think so. Especially for, I think they're much more old school type yeah. of fans with, yeah. with Emperor. And, and I see uh, that they're always, you know, like, Emperor, Emperor fans also coming, I think, to to my shows, but but also I see a lot of you know younger people, you know, who who do not have that what can I say nostalgic relationship to what I do I I did in the past, but actually have just a relationship to the music that I'm putting out now. Mm. Uh, so 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 there's it's kind of a mix, and I think uh, uh, maybe my solo some of my solo material may be. Uh, more accessible for young, uh, for newer listeners, if you will. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, I know since since Prometheus, I've also had that feedback from you know from actually some guitar developer that I've, I've worked with. Yep. That a lot of you know gent, more gent uh-huh. oriented musicians, they kind of got into us, that kind of you know the, with the it's not only Meshuggah, but you know like there's a lot of. Uh, down tune seven string stuff yeah, on, on for sure. me you know that, yeah. that 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 was kind of an early access to to different kind of of sound you know so 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 i get some of those progressive uh, in the end i i don't know yeah. you know i and i do such, such a varied thing and i in the end i just try to to make make my music as uh, as genuine as, as as good as i can and and see what happens i'm i've never been able to control how people perceive it mm. and what they make of it and my favorites from albums are rarely people's favorites <laughs> you know <laughs> yes. so 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 it's so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, so so there's no way of controlling that but i'm um uh, so when do you but, think but it's, it's it's also reward like with fascination street when i, I mixed uh, after that was the 
my third album was the first that I mixed with, with Jens. He had a fascination straight that and said, of course, he, he heard about the Emperor, but he had to be honest, he said, he, he, he actually never heard any Emperor songs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes, because then he, I knew that he would go yes. into the project, mixing it for and kind of forming it for what it was, not with any preconceptions of what it, he thought it would be. You know, and and uh, that is kind of a a balancing thing, I think, with uh, especially with live because people may have, I get a lot with festivals as well that yep. uh, that they they assume that that my music will be be more like Emperor, and uh, I've had feedback like yeah. the people, my, my management that offer offered my you know like my solo show, and it's like well it's probably too extreme for a festival, and like. Have you actually heard his music? I'm like, oh, this is perfect for a festival, and then I've been booked, you know. So it's yes. <laughs> there's a lot of preconceptions going around of what it is and what it's not. And uh, luckily, yeah. I have people to me. Uh, there's there's to also that something else that you might have recognised has happened. You're actually looked at as a legitimate guitar icon these days. So you're on, I think you've done a lot of videos for Guitar World and some guitar publications. So remove the, you know, the historic and the legacy black metal tag that a lot of people like me might associate you with, but a lot of younger, more impressionable readers and listeners, they associate you with someone who's very adept at the technical aspect of the guitar. So they probably don't even know with all due respect, the reverence that old fans have toward the Emperor catalogue. And they are actually copying a lot of the stuff that you're doing from a technical standpoint on your newer albums and also on the instructional videos you've done. So when did when do you think that crossover occurred? Is that something that's happened recently, do you think? No, the, those Guitar World things were, were ages ago, I think. So that, that was something I did, uh, so I think it's almost 10, 10 12 years ago. 10, 12 years ago. But like, I guess when, as an old fan, I'm going back sort of 25 years yeah, ago, yeah. help me. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But, so when I guess, yeah, yeah I probably no, should condense it down no, here that, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of hard to, to, to say because I, I always feel like, you know, put on the spot because I don't regard myself as particularly, uh, 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 I, I regard myself as a rather mediocre guitar player, you know, that I, I, I get to, I have the skill level to to play the stuff that I need for the most part. <laughs> you know, it's very to technical, the, though. Like what you're playing, like an, an average guitarist couldn't play what you're playing, and they certainly couldn't play and sing what you're playing. I think your level of technical expertise is probably near Dave Mustaine's. No, 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 no not at all. Like I can solo like, like that or anything. I think, and, and I see all these, you know, even mm. you know, young kids in the room. You know, back in their you know parents' house, you know, with like John Petrucci. Oh, how god! Yeah, know, yeah, those guys. Yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and you have like you know the periphery guys and all these you know super talented people. So so, and when I did you know these guitar world features as well, I mean, I was kind of embarrassed. You know, I'm, I'm you know, you, you flip over the page and there's you know Slash and Dave Mustaine and and John Petrucci, you know, tutoring. What, what the hell should I, you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> what could I bring to the table? <laughs> but then, I, so, so I, instead of focusing on technique, I, I focused on what I, I felt may, might have been, you know, uh, particular about my style of writing riffs and how I, I think about counterpoint and stuff like that. Yeah. To, to just you know, basically uh, more more from a, from a music writing point of view rather than the technical one. Hmm. And, uh, and that's that's how I approach guitar playing as well. I've uh, uh, I've no need for acrobatics at all. It's it's just a medium to for, for me to to create. There there are some guitarists, you know, and all all credit to them that treat it more like a sport, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, but, but, yeah, but but uh, but to me, it's uh, it's more. Yeah, I it, it, it's a it's a color. Of sound. <laughs> yeah, and, and that definitely comes across. The biggest issue that I – and I actually spoke to Michael Beinhorn about this, you know, the, the guy who did um, Hole's Celebrity Skin. Um, I think he did Soundgarden, Super Unknown. Definitely, yeah, he definitely did those albums, Aussies, Osmosis. And I had a good conversation with him because something that I think the younger brigade, so those underneath 30 or thereabouts, they, they aren't thinking carefully enough about the choices they're making in songwriting. 
So I'm basically referring to a whole slew of bands in metalcore and deathcore here, especially the bloody deathcore bands, because to your point about the John Petrucci stuff, I mean, these guys make Paul Gilbert sound like, I don't know, not ordinary, there's no doubt about that, but my point is they are extraordinarily gifted technically, but they haven't mm. yet worked out how to craft a song, and, and the point that I made earlier about your way of looking at things is they're not focusing enough on the production from an artistic standpoint. They just wanted to get it to sound like that bloody awful Metallica album from 2008 where it's bricked and there's no breathing room whatsoever. But, and that's... Yeah, I, but I think, I, I, but it's, it's different ideals and I think uh, the, the main thing is, especially this day and age with all the YouTubers and everything, they're all, and, I, and I've been through these phases as well, especially production-wise, that I hmm. think the, the, this idea that someone has the answer of what is the correct way of doing things, you know, yep. but but uh, uh, but uh, it it takes. What did Hannibal say in that that series? That uh, the clue to developing great taste is to learn to trust your own. Okay, there you, you go. Know? Yeah, you know, so so uh, and that is something that myself I'm struggling with constantly to trust my decision making you know in how I do things and to 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 try and build confidence to actually do that and not spend so much time second guessing you know and thinking that someone else has has the recipe or or the or, or the secret key to hmm. you know what the, what is the right way of doing things because then you know the right way if we thought like that you know there would probably be no black metal at all Oh, there was God, nothing yeah. like it. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I just say, I remember when I first heard the music, for starters, the album cover scared the living daylights out of you. So you, you were consciously aware that between black metal albums and some of the gangster hip hop and rap albums, you were going to be listening to some stuff that was going to be fairly confronting. And, and in that way, it was a breath of fresh air back in the day. And I, I think young people now because of the internet, and this is the really cool thing about when I grew up, is that you really had to discover music and you had to persist with music. And when you listened to Emperor Satyricon in Immortal in particular, you guys, the trio of you, it was music that you really had to persist with initially because it sounded like nothing else out there. It really was music that was coming from a very different place from certainly Australia. Remember that Immortal album cover mm. where, where they're in the snow? What's it? Pure, not Pure Holocaust. It's the Battles in the North. <laughs> You saw yeah, yeah. you saw pictures like that. And you thought, my God, I, I'm, I'm consciously aware that these guys are from Norway, but they must be really different to me. And in that way, it made it really interesting and, and exciting. And I feel like some of that has been eroded because of the the nature of globalization and the internet. So I guess Abs I, absolutely. I mean, this you know the, the all the black metal bands. You know, I I think it would be harder to be for people to to uh, commit to the. The, the artistic illusion yes you know yes, that it is you know yeah. and and to and to if if we you know came out as the spotted teenagers we were you know the makeup and everything created that distance it's it's like i've said before when i saw our maiden october 5th 88 you know the feeling of breathing <laughs> the same air as them in that hall yes you know i didn't care what they had for breakfast you know, to me, they were like gods. It was being like in the presence of gods, mm. and and uh, and uh, that was part of the experience. That was what made make you know a live show or your relationship to an album, you know, magical. That's what you you don't want to to to. I, I was never drawn to music that that was every day. You know, I can imagine. If, yeah. if you know, so 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 uh, and so people are drawn to this music. They. They're there to experience. That's why I think bands like Rammstein or or Ghost or all these bands, you know, they, they create an experience. Uh, I t I took my son to see uh, to see Ghost, and cool. uh, it was Kvelder Talk, who was Norwegian band Kvelder Talk was uh, supporting, mm -hmm. and it said Kvelder Talk was great, but it was just a band on stage performing their songs really well, you know, with energy. Yeah. But when Ghost came on, it was like watching a musical, you know, it was an experience. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so, and and he was ten at the time. So, so, uh, and he even he got that. Yeah, you know, so it's rare, isn't it? I'm glad you mentioned Ghost because I think they're fabulous, but they cop a lot of heat from metal fans, which I don't really understand because their music's not too different to King Diamonds, for example. And uh, exactly, so. 
Yeah, it's a funny thing. Metal fans are a very in- insular bunch. I, I, I definitely listen to heavy metal, but I don't look like a metal fan. I mean, God, most people don't, but uh, who listen to metal, it's a stereotype. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of bands have misunderstood, a lot of fans, sorry, have misunderstood Ghost and what they're trying to achieve. And I, for one, I'm just grateful that there is a band out there that has a mainstream presence for heavy metal. They're the, they're the biggest yeah, I think, commercially. I, I think it's. I discussed this with uh, with Devin Townsend who was some time back as well. I said, I think it's great to have satanic music on the Billboard chart. Yes, it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, just for the fun of it, you know. It's. Uh, <laughs> and he was like, "Why? Why? Like, you know, why distorted guitar? You know, it's a. Uh, yeah. It's it's just <laughs> that yeah. old rebellion. On yeah. that note, I think I, I really have to go, mate. No, that's fine. I really appreciate uh, you giving me so much of your time, yeah. mate. You're a legend to talk to and uh, uh, as good, if not better, an interview subject the second time around. So I really hope our paths cross in the future again. Absolutely. Me too. Thank you so much for the support, mate. And I'll look forward to seeing you in uh, in April. No worries, mate. No worries. All the best with it. Good luck with it all. Cheers, mate. Well, there you have it. Ishan from Emperor, the second of two conversations that I'm offering via YouTube, having already been available via the podcast apps for some time now. If you enjoyed that chat, please do go across and support the Scars and Guitars podcast at workworkworkscarsandguitars.com. There are plenty more conversations similar to that one there, maybe not of the same calibre, but very similar, and you can dive into them. And if you like listening, perhaps you like reading, and I've got a whole lot more to share with you about my book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. Coming up, but before I do, I'll bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. It is a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and, and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. 
All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>